Hey kids, it's Mr. Fly here, hope you're well, and welcome back to monthly bike news here on the channel. I cannot believe we've already got through January, it seems five minutes ago since it was Christmas. Anyway, I've got uh, five papers to go through, so if you're interested in what's been going on in the world of motorcycles here in the UK for the month of January 2024, you've come to the right place, let's get on with it. Alrighty, so uh, welcome back to the channel folks, and uh, Let's uh, get straight on with the news then. Lots to get through uh, on this edition. As I say, lots of stuff been happening. So first story here that grabbed my eye, Tornado breezes in. Now this is the new Benelli Tornado. A good friend of mine, Dominic, uh, used to have a Benelli, the original Tornado triple. In fact, he still has. Uh, we toured in France on it. In fact, I think way, way back on my channel is actually a video of us both uh, riding around France uh, on that. Me on my Target, him on the, on the Benelli. Anyway, the uh, new Tornado doesn't look anything like the old triple does, and it's not even a triple anymore. So I'm sure there's going to be purists that argue this isn't uh, really a Benelli Tornado. But reason why I pulled it up here is I just think it looks absolutely lovely. Now the original uh, Tornado had a very uh, uncomfortable looking pointy uh, fuel tank. It had propellers at the back which were really cool uh, and it was, a, it was a lovely looking bike in its own right, quite distinctive. This one is quite distinctive as well and I think they've uh, hit the nail on the head. It looks amazing. Anyway, let's just read what it says here. The Benelli Tornado name is back for 2024 but, we, uh, but where once it was an exotic 898cc triple it's returning for an a2 compliant twin to take on honda's cbr 500r so quite a different character uh, to this bike the tornado 500 is effectively an all-new machine uh, it offers a claim maximum power of 46.9 brake horsepower at 8500 uh, 8,500 RPM, peak torque of 34 foot-pounds at 6,000 RPM, which compares well with the 47 brake horsepower and 31 foot-pounds of the Honda CBR 500R. It's got uh, front suspension supplied by Malzocchi. Uh, front brakes comprise twin 320mm discs and twin Bem Brembo readily mounted four-pot calipers. So good cycle parts on here. Uh, it's got, it says here, striking LED riding lights, instrumentations for a five-inch colour TFT. Tornado 500 will be available in the first few months of 2024. Uh, UK prices and colours yet to be confirmed. So we don't know how much it's going to cost. I imagine it's going to be good value for money, but I think it absolutely looks the biz. Now, I haven't ridden a modern day Benelli since it got taken over. Um, well, they're still, I think, designed in Italy, but I think now built in China. I'm not sure. So many manufacturers do that sort of arrangement, don't they? Uh, but yeah, I quite like a go on one of these, I must say. I think it looks good. What do you think? Is it, uh, do you like the looks of it? Um, would you consider one? And would you like to see me do a review of one? It's, uh, it's a good opportunity for me to get some feedback from you in the comments below about what you'd like to see me ride on the channel anyway so that's the new Benelli Tornado if we can call it that people don't like uh, reusing old names if they're not happy about the bike are they it's a bit like we saw with the um, Daytona uh, Hornet and other bikes as well but uh, we've got to move on I guess haven't we with the times all right next up Aprilia's Aprilia goes naked now we haven't seen I don't think a retro Aprilia before have we and I'm as you may know if you watch my channel regularly I'm a big fan of uh, retro bikes particularly retro naked bikes and this one looks really nice I often um, uh, complain about Aprilia's well actually I don't not Aprilia's actually look pretty good normally but I've never seen a retro as I say before from them. anyway what it says here Aprilia goes naked stripped back retro version of the sporty RS457 has been spied testing these spy pictures give us the first look at Aprilia's upcoming retro influence naked version of their all new twin cylinder RS457 Sportster so yet another uh, twin cylinder bike being launched onto the market they just uh, Every, everything seems to be going twill. Let's have some more triples. Let's have some more four-cylinder bikes. Uh, it has an underslung exhaust and stealth black body finish. Suggests it's still some way off of going on sale. At the bike's heart is an all-new 457cc parallel twin, which features in the RS457. Uh, that unit produces a claimed 47 brake horsepower. Uh, new rear suspension, new subframe. Uh, what we can tell from the spy pictures is that there are reasonably high one-piece tubular handlebars, a TFT dash, and a round LED headlight. We'd expect the finished version to be officially unveiled towards the autumn, with a price of around £6,000. So another one of these great value for money bikes. I don't think we've seen a bike... Have we in that price range from Aprilia before? So uh, a bit of a departure for them as well. And it looks, doesn't it, kind of superficially similar to the new Triumph uh, 400s, which I cannot wait uh, to have a go on. More about those later in bike news. It's kind of competing in that same area, isn't it? It'll be interesting to see which one of those two win. Uh, obviously, Triumph has got a bit of a head start, being probably better known for retro bikes, so we shall see. All right. Next story, and it's a letter here that uh, caught my attention. It's from uh, Steve W from Essex. He says, when less is more. 
having to phone, and this is, don't get me started on this, but I'll read you the letter anyway. Uh, having to phone my insurer to pay my renewal multi-bike policy, I told them that I'd recently sold one of my bikes, so I had 10 to insure instead of 11. Lucky man. Uh, I was shocked to find it was £100 more. How can this be? I've no idea, Steve. Insurance is an absolute mystery to me. I think, actually, I've described it in the past as a racket. They seem to make it up as they go along. I have spoken to insurance companies a lot about this in the past. In fact, I've been in, um, sponsored by two insurance companies in the past. Both Bennett's and Principal Insurance have sponsored the channel over the years. Um, but I still maintain, it, it just they just seem to make it up as they go along. I've just renewed my insurance as well. Another year of no claims on all my bikes and all the premiums have gone up. Now, I know some people will write to me and say, well, everything's gone up. Premiums across the board have gone up because of wars and all that sort of thing. And reinsurance means these, these um, prices get passed on to us. Doesn't matter what sort of insurance you buy. That may well be the case, but it is a bit galling, isn't it? When you've, uh, you know, you've had what you think is a clean year. Well, it definitely is a clean year in terms of accidents or thefts, anything like that. In fact, I've never made a claim on a motorcycle insurance or indeed I think any insurance in my life. Uh, yet we're forced to have it by, by law uh, and it goes up each year. Just annoys me. Anyway, I'm in danger of getting onto a rant, but uh, of which I have made uh, videos on before, and I know this is a this is a subject that piques many people's interest. But an interesting uh, letter there from Steve W from Essex. So I feel your pain, Steve. Right, next up, bullets. A real retro charm again. A lot of retro stuff uh, in this week's bike news or this month's bike news. This one from Royal Enfield, the uh, Bullet 350. Now this is a bike initially when it came out. I didn't much. Uh, I wasn't very excited about because it it's a uh, Basically taking the 350, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Running gear, if you like, the engine, the frame, etc., uh, and just dressed it up slightly different to what's on the classic 350 or on the, um, what's the other one? Can't remember the name of it, but the, all the 350s are based on similar um, running gear. And I don't really like what they've done with the looks of the bullet. I've never liked the seat on bullets for some reason. They just, that sort of stepped look doesn't work for me. Uh, but I do like the colour scheme on this. But anyway, let's see, uh, let's see what it says here. So the new generation bullet 350 chassis and J-series engine setup was first used for the 2021 Meteor Cruiser, followed by the sporty Hunter 350. That was the one that I couldn't remember the name of, the Hunter. Love that bike. And the Classic 350. I know the Classic 350 well. I've got one at the moment in the garage, in fact, on a long-term loan, which more coming on the channel soon. Um, it's the priciest of Enfield's 350 lineup, but costing just 4629 It's still a bargain for a quality motorcycle with genuine big bike feel. Uh, I have to say, apart from the seat in this colour scheme, it does look quite nice. I do like the switch gear and so on on the Royal Enfields as well. But I, otherwise, it's very similar to the classic 350, which I think I'd prefer. Uh, I think it just, uh, you know, it looks better to me. Again, another bike that's going to be in that whole mix with the new Triumph 400s. And I personally think, having not ridden them yet, those Triumph 400s are going to sell like hot cakes and are going to start to dent sales of some of these Enfield 350s for sure. All right, so that was it uh, for the first paper whiz through. Right, next up, second paper of the month. First story, we've already mentioned it, uh, I think already, return of the Daytona. Now I did make a brief video when the Daytona was launched last month. If you haven't seen that, go and check that out in the corner. But there's been lots of videos since and now the press have in fact started to ride them. So this, I think, was when it was launched. There's a, I think there might be a ride review coming up later. I can't quite remember, but I think there might be. Anyway, the Daytona, always an iconic name. Um, people get upset, as I said before, when bikes come back and they don't quite meet expectations. The Daytona in the past was a sharp scalpel-like uh, bike, which was kind of the top of the super sport mid mid rate mid middleweight sports bike league if you like and uh, this one isn't that because this is a twin uh, it's got less power and so on but having said all that I think it looks absolutely cracking. It has got the triple engine in it, and the you know the basis of the engine, although it's been breathed on and tweaked a lot over the years, is still what originally came to us in the in the guise of the Daytona, the original um, 675 Daytona, which became the Street Triple, uh, which became the Street Triple 765, which became the Moto 2 unit. All those engines are, are basically the same architecture, albeit in different states of tune with different, you know, farkles. But anyway, I do love the triple engine, and I imagine the one in the 660 will sound absolutely amazing. Um, when when you give it the beans and for the road you don't need any more power than this I don't think I think this could be a really nice addition to my collection in fact because I do love sports bikes and the way they look but they just don't work for me on the road because they are too performant I have no self-control if I get on a thousand cc sports bike I just break the speed limit ride like a nutter everywhere and I feel like I'm going to kill myself at any moment uh, I, maybe that won't be the case with the Daytona so I can't wait to ride one of these let's see anyway enough of me chatting what do MCN say so the much-anticipated Daytona 660 uses an updated version of the company's existing 660cc triple to sit alongside the Trident 660 Naked and the Tiger Sport 660 Tourer. 
Got it so far, and I love the Tiger Sports Accessories, by the way. This is kind of a squashed, sporty version of that, if you like. Uh, it sets to offer a softer approach to sporty riding, providing a middleweight that can be used on a daily basis, which appeals to me. It's going to be comfortable as well. I love my old Panigale. I do miss not having a sports bike in my garage, but that thing, every time I got on it and rode it, it was torture. And again, I want to ride like a lunatic all the time. This thing looks almost as nice, uh, not quite, almost, um, but I imagine it'll be a lot more comfortable and a lot more forgiving. Anyway, whilst that stance won't appeal to some fans of previous sportier Daytonas, as we were saying just now, it should prove to be a hit with riders jumping up to a bigger bike as well as experienced pilots wanting a less focused riding experience, that's me, uh, for their wrists and knees and who aren't yet prepared to give up the sports bike life. I can really see one of these in my garage in the future if it rides nice. Uh, power sits at a claim 93 brake horsepower, which is absolutely perfect level for the road, I think. Um, Clip-on bars sit above the top yoke, much like the rival Suzuki and Honda, to create an engaging position without encouraging discomfort at slower speeds and the seat height is 810 mil yeah looks really nice cannot wait to have a go 8595 pounds we've got loads of sub 10 grand bikes on the market now which really are desirable so uh, that's great news we've had a period of time we last i know five years bikes seem to be getting more expensive more expensive and they have been um uh, inflation and all that sort of stuff but now when you're looking at the thousand cc plus bikes all costing 15 16 grand and more um it's just getting really expensive hobby isn't it now there's some great choices below the 10 grand mark which still isn't a small amount of money but at least they're a bit more accessible to more of us Right, next up, interesting this, Silverstone cancel bike track days. Now, Silverstone is my local circuit. I live in Buckinghamshire, and Silverstone is in Buckinghamshire. Um, real shame to hear this. Let's see what it says. Silverstone Racing Circuit have announced that they will be running no more motorcycle track days in 2024. Managing Director of Silverstone, Stuart Pringle, further said, we're currently reviewing the bike track day offering and we'll be relaunching re it within the next year. We haven't taken this decision lightly, as we know that will be disappointment for some of our customers. He continued, however, we were finding that our existing Bike Track Days product was not proving as popular as we needed them to be, so we're going to take some time to look at the needs of our customers, research the options, and then we'll bring back track action for our two-wheeled customers. So, yeah, it's got to come back, and it? Silverstone Home and Motorsport in the UK, as far as I'm concerned, but I'm biased, it being my local track. Uh, really weird, though. You know, I've read those words, and I understand what he said, but I don't quite understand... Um, it sounds like it just hasn't been very popular, and I don't really know what they can do to make them more popular. Maybe the smaller tracks are a little bit more engaging for riders. Uh, you know, the likes of um, Mallory Park and uh, um, also one in Kent, Brands Hatch. God, my memory's absolutely shot. I've just come back from a skiing holiday, so I'm absolutely bananas at the moment. I'm still a bit, uh, you know, in holiday mode. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's a shame, isn't it? So. Uh, I do wonder, though, from the comments, is it just that track days are becoming less popular? I don't know. Where do you stand on track days? Again, I'd be interested to know in the comments below. I've done a few of my time. Uh, I enjoyed them. Uh, I think everybody should do one once or twice in their biking career because it makes you understand what a bike can actually do and how much room you really need to corner and all that sort of thing. But they never really grabbed me, didn't really hook me in. I'm not the sort of person that has to do several a year. You know, if I never do a track day again, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm actually not that bothered. But, uh, but anyway, I know there are lots of fans of track days out there, so you know, it's just horses for course isn't it right next up gosh look at this thing it says here h2 by name h2 by nature kawasaki offer glimpse into the future with hydrogen ninja h2 sx concept now this is a hydrogen bike i have to say for me the styling looks bloated and horrible that's mainly because the things at the back that look like panniers are actually the hydrogen tanks and that's the issue with using hydrogen it's great because it's an internal combustion engine basically you can continue with the engines you've already got but they've got to be converted to run on hydrogen but that can be done but actually carrying the stuff to get the same sort of calorific value the same energy value as petrol you need to you have to have these massive pressurized tanks and this is what kawasaki have come up with uh, i have to say if this is what hydrogen bikes are going to look like then count me out but uh, i like the concept at least anyway let's see what it says here unveiled at the company's internal group vision 2030 conference in mid-december it's called the ninja h2 h2 hyse that trips off the tongue uh, and it makes it makes it past the concept stage could be japan's first hydrogen powered motorcycle yeah it looks flipping awful doesn't it <laughs> i imagine it won't get past the concept stage uh, again unless you think it looks good let me know next up pocket rockets more sports bike action we mentioned didn't we there's lots of uh, sports bikes now uh, knocking about this is an interesting uh, comparison that mcn have done i like the way that they do this they've compared the old uh, kawasaki zxr 400 against the new zx4 rr sort of on paper similar types of bikes to see uh, how much things have moved on uh, so let's have a look at the verdict shall we uh, i have to say the looks of the old bike appeal to me more than the new one um i just love the looks of that zxr 400 it's great right verdict 
So in terms of star ratings, they've given them each four stars out of five, which is interesting. Uh, the ZXR400 is saying 3,999. I don't know if that was the as new price, or well, that's the price you can get them second hand now. Uh, and the ZX4RR, the new bike, 8,700. So uh, basically half the price for the older bike. It says here, the new bike offers a serious buzz. I was expecting to fall head over heels for the ZXR400, the older bike. Um, and to an extent I did, yet the ZX4RR, the new bike, offers a serious buzz in a more user-friendly package. Yes, the ZXR is focused fast and has that gorgeous styling that makes machinery from over 20 years ago so sought after. That's the bit I like. Uh, but its extreme nature comes at a price, as it's a brutal machine for anything other than riding at 10 tenths. Away from the track, the newbie may not have the same soul and aggressive stance as its forebear, but it's far more suited to the roads and traffic of today. Well, that, I wasn't expecting to hear that. And uh, that's nice, actually, isn't it? Because so often uh, these reviews happen and we hear, oh, Doom and Glenn, we've not really made any progress. But uh, sounds like certainly have in the case of the, uh, of the Kawasaki smaller capacity sports bikes. Excellent. All right, that's it for the second paper. How are we doing for time? OK, about halfway through. I might have to speed it up a little bit. Three stories from this paper. Easy pillin to swallow. Great headline, MCN. Love what you've done there. <laughs> Do you remember the Vip pillin and the Svart pillin? Um, the black and the white arrow from uh, Husqvarna. Well, they've been uh, relaunched, or, or basically they've had a had an update. Uh, and I think they're looking a little better for it. I was not a massive fan of the old ones, it has to say. But the black version, the Svart pillin, with, uh, with these knobbly tyres, I think actually looks quite good. So, uh, again, I'm semi-tempted to, to see if I can borrow one of these from Husky. Husky are very keen to lean, uh, loan me bikes, so I'm sure I can get one. Uh, but again, let me know in the comments below if you're interested in a review of this, uh, and, and, and I'll do so. Anyway, let's see what it says here. Husqvarna reveals second generation 125 and 401 Vip Pillen and Svart Pillen singles. 44.3 brake horsepower, usable on the road, 820 mil seat height, relatively tall. Um, and the 125 is 4,899. Quite a lot of money for a 125 when you think, you know, you can get these uh, the 350s and the 400s for not much more money than that now. The 401 is 5,599. So not, not mega money, but uh, I think the 125 is quite expensive. Anyway, the incoming Husqvarna's will be built in India by long-term partner Bajaj, or is it Baha? I'm not quite sure. Uh, in fact, they build... Are they the ones that are building the Triumphs? I can't remember. Anyway, it's a similar sort of arrangement. Uh, dripping in advanced tech, uh, the Huskers are said to now be easier to live with than before, thanks to a lower seat height and a more relaxed riding position. So, yeah, let me know what you think of those. Uh, I think it's definite improvement on the looks front. Um, but would I have one over one of the new Triumphs? Probably not, but that's just me. That's just a matter of taste. Tiger hunting, Suzuki's new V-Strom 800 RE takes on Triumph and Honda as Adventure Road middleweights battle for supremacy. This again is another class of bike, isn't it, that's really going strongly at the moment. There's so many great bikes in this class. So they're pitting here the V-Strom 800 RE, which I've not ridden yet, against the Honda Transout, which I've ridden, absolutely loved that, uh, and the Triumph Tiger 850 Sport, which I also rode and absolutely loved. And in fact, I think I said the 850 Sport, which is the sort of cut down cheaper version of the uh, Tiger 900 was probably the best of the bunch because it was quite a bit cheaper but it had all the good stuff. So let's see what um, MCN made, what's their verdict? Some stiff competition, says Jim Moore. The Trans Alps got a lot going for it. Handsome styling, fine handling, effective weather protection, clever electronics, tempting price and lightness of touch to its ride. Well, that sounds pretty darn good, doesn't it? And I agree, it's a great bike. Suzuki have hit the ground running with the V-Strom 800 RE. It's attractively priced and comes with a few tempting luxuries, like uh, an original equipment quick shifter. Okay. And the Tiger 900 routes give the 850 Sport a solid, secure feel. And despite tuning changes uh, to catch the A2 markets, inline triple has lost none of its charm. It's our clear winner here. So uh, Jim at least thinks the Triumph is the one to have. And yeah. As I say, I haven't, I haven't ridden the Suzuki, so I can't comment on that, But uh, and I did love the Trans Out, but I just love a triple engine, and uh, that, that Triumph was really, really nice when I rode it. It's £10,095, so, so I think it's probably the most expensive of the bunch. Yeah, the Honda's 9699 and the Suzuki 9699. So yeah, a little bit more expensive, but I think probably worth the money. All right, next up, final one in this paper. Shotgun has hit the target, another Royal Enfield. Now, this is called the Shotgun 650, and when I first saw this, um, I wasn't that excited. In fact, I kind of read a press release, I think, I thought, well, that's not for me, because it's a cruiser. And I'm not a big fan of, so far, the cruisers that uh, Royal Enfield have showed us. Well, I can't try to remember what the name of that other one was. I had it recently to borrow. Anyway, I wasn't a massive fan of it. It's a perfectly good bike, but I don't, I'm not really a cruiser man. 
I always say that whenever I've got a cruiser that I turn out to like. Anyway, uh, but the more I look at this, the more I'm thinking perhaps it's not quite as cruiserish as I thought. And I saw uh, Neves's review on MCN on their YouTube channel, and he absolutely loved the bike. So I'm curious about this, and I, I'm I'm kind of willing to give it a, a second chance. So if you fancy seeing me riding one of these again, let me know below in the comments if you, if because uh, I'm going to do less bike reviews this year. Basically, I'll be very choosy about the reviews that I do. And I'm only going to do stuff that I think you, my audience, will enjoy. Now I have a feeling. The Shotgun 650 from Royal Enfield is one that you're going to enjoy. So I'm quite tempted to see if I can line one of these up and, and have a go. See if I can change my mind, see if it's uh, not actually the cruiser that I thought it was. Because that was, I think, if I remember right, Neves' kind of conclusion. Anyway, let's read what it says here. Current Royal Enfields are neutral handling, sure-footed beasts that roll effortlessly, effortlessly into corners. Many ex-Triumph employers are involved in the development, engineering and testing. And the Indian-built Shotgun has the easy bounce feel of a Hinkley bike. But what makes the Shotgun 650 so appealing, like all Royal Enfields, is the price. It's the antidote to uber expensive retro. There's nothing cheap feeling about it, which is, I mean, the build quality of Enfields has really gone up. Uh, the summary here, and is this Neavesy? Yep, it is. There's more to the new Shotgun 650 than meets the eye. It's a simple retro cruiser. It's also a sporty and fun to ride, thanks to neutral handling. It's also solidly finished and nicely detailed. It punches well above its weight and for all uh, and all for a lot less money than its retro cruiser competition. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Neves is my favourite uh, MCN reviewer, as I'm sure I said. I respect his opinions on pretty much everything. Um, so if he says it's good, it's definitely worth another look. And the more I look at it, the more I kind of like the looks of it, actually. The, the way the headlight is sort of fared in in that nacelle, I kind of like. I kind of like the big fuel tank on it. I just, uh, yeah, it's growing on me, that one. It's a grower. So, yeah, I think I'll... Uh, Probably see if I can tap my friends up at Royal Enfield and have a little go on that at some point in the summer. Right, next up, only two stories from this paper. A couple of quickies. First one, BMW's sales hit historic high. Now, I'm, I'm interested in this because at the moment, as you may recall if you've been watching the channel recently, I've got a long-term loan of the new GS1300. Uh, loads of videos on the channel and more coming up on that bike soon. It's a fantastic bike to ride. I'm still a bit challenged by the looks of it, but there's no doubt it's a great bike to ride. Uh, so anyway, BM, I'm interested to see how sales go on those uh, compared to the old GS, because as I say, it is a quite a departure in the looks department, and I wonder whether it's going to put off a lot of traditional GS riders, but this would suggest not. BMW Motorrad uh, helped celebrate their centenary by achieving record sales across 2023. Europe as a whole remained by far the strongest performer, with Eastern Europe in particular, achieved flourishing figures with 6,000 units sold in the region, more than double the number they sold in 2022. The latest Adventure Edition, the R1300 GS, contributed a further 4,528 units uh, sold following its strong autumn release. That sounds like a big number, doesn't it? It hasn't been out for long. Uh, so it says here on the picture, with 4528 sales and counting, the new GS is flying. Now, I knew that the new GS would sell, of course, because there are diehard stalwart GS fans, and I class myself as a fanboy of the GS, uh, who would buy one no matter what. And lots of people on maybe P PCP and stuff where the deals are renewing uh, and they want to get, carry on with PCP may just opt for this as a matter of course because they haven't really got anywhere else to go maybe. Um, so so it's not surprising that they are selling, um, but I will be interested to see in five years looking back whether the sales remain strong on this bike compared to how well they did on the 1250, for example. But early indications are it's selling well, which was a bit of a surprise actually to me. Although, as I say, I don't want to come across negative. On the video I made recently where I talked about, well, it was titled Top 5 Things I Hate About the GS1300. I'll put a link in the corner. And I thoroughly admit, I used the hate word because it was kind of a bit of clickbait. It's the way you trigger the YouTube algorithms. It upset a lot of you that I said that. They're just minor niggles, really. But, uh, and I do explain that in the video. But anyway, um, Despite there being things about the bike that make it not perfect, it is an incredible bike to ride. I have to say it's definitely the best GS to ride to date. There's no doubt about that. And I challenge anyone to say different. Although it is, it is different in that it feels quite different. You sit on this bike as opposed to in it and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, more on that coming on the channel soon. Right, moving on. How about it, Honda? Now, this is an interesting story. This is a, a good looking bike, I think. It's a bike that's only available in Japan. Uh, and MCN is saying here, basically, why can't we have it? Because it looks good. So let me read you what it says. Uh, we test Honda's Hawk 11 in Japan, and we wish they'd import it. Honda's striking Hawk 11 calf racer burst into the scene at the beginning of 2022 using the parallel twin found in the Africa Twin NT 1100 and CMX 1100 Rebel in a sleek package. Yet another twin. Uh, it has sadly never been released in the UK, leaving fans of sporty retro bikes disappointed. This was made worse still by the demise of the Triumph Thruxton 1200, which I'm amazed Triumph for stopping, uh, which will depart dealers at the end of 2024, leaving nothing in the mainstream to scratch that itch. So it's interesting, isn't it? This does look kind of, 
Well, it looks a bit more like the Speed, what do they call it? The Speed um, the Speed Triple Classic one. can't remember what it was called now, which had a very extreme riding position. It's kind of in that genre, but not quite as extreme, I think. Uh, so just what is this mystery cafe racer like to ride, or cafe racer like to ride? It says here, it's like a gentleman's GT and almost what Triumph should have aimed to achieve with their Speed Triple 1200RR. That was the part I tried to remember. It looks kind of similar, but I just found that too extreme to ride. Lovely looking, but not a practical proposition in the way that my Panigale wasn't. Although so Honda confirmed to MCN this week that there are no plans for the model to come to the UK or Europe. Never say never. But uh, yeah, so do you like the look of this? If enough people say so below, maybe we can get Honda to bring it in. Uh, it does look nice, I must say. When I was in Japan recently on my Japan tour, I saw quite a lot of uh, bikes that are only available, and they tended to be Hondas that are only available in Japan that you can't get now here because of uh, European emissions rules and that sort of thing. Uh, and it is quite interesting to see what countries allow what bikes in. Now, somebody was telling me recently, actually, which was quite interesting, a comment, I think it was from someone in Canada, sorry, I can't remember your name, um, who said that the new GS1300 with that uh, with the rear lights not on the center line, i.e. it doesn't have a rear light, does it, because the radar's there, uh, was saying that that won't be allowed into Canada because of that reason. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's very it's an interesting point, isn't it? And there's all sorts of rules and regs like that. That means that you know manufacturers, if they want them to go to every country, they have to meet everybody's rules. This one clearly doesn't, which is a shame because it does look lovely. Alrighty, that was it. Just the two stories in that paper. Okay, how are we doing? It says 26 minutes on there. All right, so we're getting up to the half hour. Last paper then, and then we'll get on to parish notices. A few stories in here. Uh, first one, Honda Hornet on tour. Sources in Japan suggest this four-cylinder sports tour is on the way. Now, this is great news because, again, this looks lovely. Um, it's uh, it's in the sport tourer category, which is one of my favourites because it gives you all the looks of a sports bike. You know, the un untrained eye or a person in the street that's not into bikes would just think it's a sports bike. Uh, but it gives you the comfort of a tourer or of an adventure bike. And I think it's a bit of a resurgence of people liking this sort of bike. I'm certainly one of them. I love, for example, the Karasaki, I think it's called the Ninja... 1000 SX now, isn't it? Uh, I love that bike, the bikes of that genre. This is slotting into there, I think. Let me read what it says. Honda are rumoured, uh, are rumoured, oh, sorry, it's a bit of a typo here. Honda are rumoured to be working on a four cylinder sports tourer that's based on the incoming CB1000 Hornet Naked, ready to take on the likes of Suzuki's, this is a tongue twister, GSXS1000 GT and Kawasaki Ninja 1000 SX. Sources in Japan have informed MCN that the bike will appear around six months on from the arrival of the Naked and will be called the CB1000 Hornet S. Likely to... <laughs> ah, sorry about that abrupt uh, disruption of service there. Believe it or not, my Osmo Action 4 camera overheated. I used to have that problem with my uh, GoPro when I was using GoPros and then I ended up blowing a fan on it during bike news to keep it cool. Uh, clearly the Osmo Action suffers from the same thing. So I've just cooled the camera down, put a cooler battery in it. We'll, we'll probably have to speak even quicker to get through this... Uh, uh, faster than already was, but anyway, we're almost there. We talked about the Honda Hornet 1000, weren't we? So, um, yeah, likely to replace the CB1000R naked. The new Hornet still remains a largely a mystery with the brand so far only confirming minimal details, including that power will be more than 147.5 brake horsepower. So bags of power on this, but maybe, hopefully, a little bit more friendly than maybe, uh, you know, riding the latest Fireblade or whatever around the road. So again, let's hope this comes sooner rather than later. I think this is a great move. and I'm really looking forward to seeing more sports tourers on the market. So well done, Honda. Right, next up. Gears are a box of tricks. Now this is a bizarre story, this. Uh, Kimco's have painted a virtual gearbox that feels just like the real thing on electric bikes. Check this out. While electric concepts and production bikes have become much more familiar, one element of the Kimco machine is still unusual, a multi-speed gearbox and clutch like a normal bike. Patent applications from Kimco have been, uh, sorry, new patent applications from Kimco have been published, revealing that it, it's actually far from conventional. In fact, the gears and clutch proposed in the patent are entirely simulated in software. Uh, even though the clutch at lever and shifter look and feel real. It's a route that makes a huge amount of sense, says MCN. I thought this makes no sense, but actually it does make sense when you read the whole article. Electric bikes already tend to offer multiple modes for their power delivery and the regenerative braking effect of the motor. So why not use a gear shift to control those features on the fly in an instantly familiar way, rather than digging through menus on a kit, on a... Um, Dashboard, which make, it does indeed make sense, doesn't it, we think of it like that. Far from being a gimmick, the Kimco gearbox, while a simulation, could actually make for a bike that's more engaging and controllable than one without it. So I just thought this was fascinating. I mean, it's a weird looking thing, isn't it? I'm not sure whether I like the looks of it or not. Hard to tell from this picture. But um, yeah, the idea that it's got a clutch and gearbox simulated 
but actually means you can control the you know the tremendous torque and punch of an electric motor easier on a motorcycle and be able to feather the clutch and so on. Quite like that idea. What do you make of that? I do. I do like uh, the new technology that comes out. Whether this actually ever gets the light of day or whatever, I don't know. But uh, who knows? Uh, Thirty years down the line, maybe we'll still be using clutches. Um, and but but on an electric bike like this, and there's actually no actual gearbox, no actual gears, none of the extra weight. Um, involved. There have been electric bikes in the past that have had gearboxes on, but proper physical gearboxes, and all that does is add weight to an already weighted machine. So if you can simulate it in software, why not do it? Interesting idea. Okay, oh yeah, I just want to mention this one. Uh, they have a series in MTN called Out and About where they go and visit um, biker cafes and stuff, and they've been to Gilks or Jilks. Uh, and I mention that because it's just great to see the place again. I don't know if you remember, but I went, did a uh, biker scram with Jeff and Dan J Jilks uh, last year. I'll put a link in the corner. I can't remember what uh, star rating we gave it, but uh, I know we enjoyed it and it was a great place to go. So uh, yeah, if you're out in that uh, area, it's a place called Kyneton in Warwickshire, go and check them out. Maybe it's a summer pursuit, but it is a great place. It says here, set amid majorly fun back roads and draped with rich motoring history, Gilks or Jilks, I can't remember which, uh, Garage Cafe welcomes bikers with open arms for brekkie, banter, and more than your typical greasy spoon. Yeah, great little cafe there. Great to see it in MCM. Okay, penultimate story until we get on to parish notices. It's great, but Suzuki haven't gone far enough with the new GSXS 1000 GX. Now this is a bike that uh, I'm looking forward to riding because again it fits into that sort of sport tour category. Uh, I do quite like the looks of it. I've been looking forward to riding it, but I think this is Neevesy again. Yeah, it's Neevesy, my favourite reviewer, has um, has uh, basically said it doesn't quite live up to expectations. Let me read you his verdict and then we'll have a talk about it. Our deep dive reveals the GSXS 1000 GX to be a capable sport tourer, but it isn't the consumer all-rounder we hoped it would be. That's a shame, because I was hoping it would be. Uh, it's all-day comfy, even for taller riders, and adding a pillion doesn't upset bike or rider, although passengers are exposed to wind blast. But braking performance is poor, the screen tricky to adjust at the roadside, tyre choice average, and its lights through corners weak. The lack of a top box will restrict its touring aspirations. It's well built and reasonably well equipped, but this is a 15 grand motorcycle and Suzuki haven't gone the extra mile needed for the price. Heated grips and a centre stand are glaring emissions. So given those points, it's kind of hard to disagree, isn't it, with these? It doesn't even have a heated grips or a centre stand on a sport touring bike. Those are £400 plus options on the bike. Such a shame. I had high, high hopes for this. 15599 for the GSX S1000 GX Plus, which is the one that comes with panniers, but no option for top box. What sort of a sport tour is that? Very strange. My wife won't ride on a bike without a top box, so that would, uh, you know, that sort of cuts it out of my search space immediately. Such a shame. I'm not going to ride the bike off myself, though. I do like the look of it, and I like to have a go on one. So, again, let me know uh, in the comments below if this is one of the bikes you'd like to see me review this year. As I say, I'm only going to review a few bikes. I'm going to be very choosy about the ones I do, but this is definitely on my personal list, unless you tell me otherwise. So, that was interesting. Okay, and then the final story here, Little Bike, Big Character. This is the Speed 400 that uh, we mentioned a few times, actually, in Bike News this month. I really like the look of this. These bikes I had, uh, just before Christmas, I had the, um, the, the Scrambler and the Speed 400 in the garage, but they were... They weren't mock-ups, but they were kind of pre-production bikes that didn't run. So I made a video looking at the quality of the build and so on. Again, if you haven't seen that, I'll put a link in the corner. I was really blown away by how these look. They look no different from any other Triumph in terms of their build quality, even though they're built uh, you know, to a price and by a third-party partner. It's Baja Bajaj again. It is the people that uh, are doing the uh, Husky that we mentioned earlier. So, yeah, there's been a few reviews now online and, and so on. I've seen some YouTube videos, people riding this. Everybody is saying it's an absolutely cracking bike. Um, I think I, I did actually get invited to this launch, but I, I, it's a matter of policy. I don't go to bike launches. I'd rather ride them at home in good old British weather, you know, in the rain in High Wycombe or something, rather than in the sunshine in Spain or Portugal, wherever the launch was, um, just because it's a bit more realistic, I think. Um, but anyway, I'm, I will be talking to Triumph soon to try and work out when I can get hold of one of these. Often uh, the bikes are in the shops before you can actually get them on the press fleet, as is the case now. I think you can already buy these. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get a ride on one as soon as I can because I cannot wait to have a go. Let me read you the verdict here. I'll read you the verdict in full. The Speed 400 truly is stunning, well put together bit of kit. The finish is exquisite it and although it's usable and friendly with its light nature it has the essence and stature of the far bigger capacity speeds in the triumph lineup
This is great stuff. It handles just as well with a chassis and suspension setup that is absolutely divine, topped off with a new single cylinder motor that is punchy and fun, even if it's a bit overexcitable. Overall, the Speed 400 is an impressive machine that transcends the A2 license category and its modest 398cc capacity to be a decent performing premium machine and all for under £5,000. You do not get much more of a glowing review on a bike than that, do you? I think this is going to fly off the shelves and I, for one, cannot wait to ride it. Okay, welcome to Parish Notices, the uh, part of the uh, bike news where I'll just give you a bit of a rundown of what's coming up on the channel. First off though, before I do that, I want to show you this new image that the guys at ABR have put together. It's been on my screen here the whole time actually. So the ABR Festival, in my opinion, is the best bike meet or best bike do of the year. In fact, it's probably this year, probably the only one I'm going to go to. Uh, so if you haven't got your tickets already, do consider coming along. It's absolutely brilliant. It says here it's on the 28th to the 30th of June. Um, last year the weather was absolutely cracking. Let's hope it remains the case this year. Uh, I'm doing a couple of things at the festival. You can come along and see those and I'll be wandering around with Mrs. Flyer all through the festival anyway. So do come and say hello if you see us there. If you haven't got yourself a ticket yet, you can get yourself 5% off if you use the code TMF5 when you check out. Um, and I really look forward to seeing you there. So uh, yeah, and thanks to the guys from ABR for coming up with these natty looking images. It looks all quite professional, doesn't it? Excellent stuff. Okay, so that was that. Um, the other thing I want to say was, um, thank you very much indeed to everybody who watched the Japan tour. It has now finished. The last episode was last Saturday. Uh, 10 episodes, 20 minutes each. I personally think in terms of its content, it was the best tour that we've done yet. Um, so uh, if you haven't had a chance to watch that, do go back and have a look at that. Thank you to everybody for all the lovely comments. The comments, I think, bar one, <laughs> that said it was the most boring tour I'd ever done and how could I make such an amazing country look so tedious. Um, other than that, everybody else said uh, it was a great tour. So um, I personally think the videos work pretty well, so if you haven't had a chance to watch them, do so. Um, and then, oh, the other thing I was going to say, and something I, I don't say enough, actually, I have no affiliation with MCM whatsoever. I did, a few years back, I did used to write a, a monthly column in MCM, which was great. Um, but they let me do this bike news. They're fully aware that I do bike news, and I'm, I'm just using their their journalism. It's They've done the, the legwork. All I've done is read the papers and summarise some of the key stories. But all I do is pick out very much highlights that appeal to me. There's way more on MCN than I uh, than I ever cover off. So I was just going to say, you know, if you are interested, get yourself a subscription to MCN. It's not that expensive. You get a paper every week and it is full of interesting stuff. I'm just barely scratching the surface here. So uh, just thought it was important I said that once in a while. All right, coming up then uh, on the channel, the next video you see on Saturday uh, is going to be a vlog on the new GS on the 1300. I just took it for a ride, did a bit of sort of soul therapy. So hopefully you'll enjoy that one. And then on Valentine's Day, 14th of February, uh, something a little bit different. This is something that people ask me quite a lot. And uh, I think the video will probably do quite well because it will appeal to people that aren't just motorcyclists. But I'll tell you the, the title of the video is, how much did YouTube pay me for 93 million views? So uh, that basically tells you all in a nutshell that you want to know. People often ask me, you know, how much money do you make on YouTube? And, and people don't like to talk about it. I've got a feeling YouTube don't like you talking about it. So I hope I don't get into any trouble. But uh, basically in that, I'm going to show you the stats and how much I've earned uh, on YouTube since I started. So that may be of interest or not to you. But that's coming up uh, on the 14th of Feb. On the 17th, I've got my first ride review of, or to me, the new Ducati Diablo V4. I love the Diablo in terms of the way it looks, but I haven't ridden one for ages. The V4 has been out for, well, a couple of years now, I think. So I've only just got around to riding it. I've got it parked in the garage. It was delivered today. I cannot wait to get out and ride it. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's me sorted for tomorrow when the, I think the weather's slightly better. Uh, so that's that. In fact, when I say tomorrow, I'm recording this on Tuesday for publishing on Wednesday. Uh, I might be out riding that while you're watching this film. Um, but that video itself coming out on the 17th of February. The 21st of February, um, I do a tour of Wales on the new GS. I want to check out what the bike is like um, actually on tour practically. I've toured on my old GS 1200 many times in Wales and other places. Let's give it a go on the GS 1300, see how it compares. So that's coming up. 24th of February, top five things I dislike about the classic 350. This is the other long-term bike that I've got uh, on loan at the moment, the Royal Enfield 350 Classic. I do love the bike overall, which is why I've gone for it as a long-term loaner, but it's not perfect. Uh, and there's top five things coming up on that of my dislikes. 28th of Feb, long-awaited 1250 GS versus the R1300 comparison. I did a 1200 versus 1300 comparison the video, did very well. And everybody said, well, that's all very well, but what about the 1250 versus the 1300? So I took the chance when I was in Wales, uh, my 
friend Ian has a brand new 1250. We did a direct back-to-back -back comparison on that. So that's coming out on the 28th of February, if you can wait that long. And then the next bike news is on the 2nd of March. So uh, yeah, look forward to speaking to you again then. There might be some other things in between times as well, who knows. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Till then, this has been the Missing and Fly. Cheerio. Hey kids, we're the Missing and Flyers. 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 Flyers.